welcome to Riverside Presbyterian Church. I am Dale Jackson, and I am glad you are joining us for worship. I have a few announcements before we begin. On Friday evenings, we continue Fridays with Ted. Login information can be found on our website. Theology on Tap returns Monday, April 19th at 7 o'clock p.m. We will discuss Diana Butler Bass's new book, Freeing Jesus, Rediscovering Jesus as Friend, Teacher, Savior, Lord, Way, and Presence. In the book, she explores the question, how can you still be a Christian? This Wednesday evening is a session meeting at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday, the Reverend Dr. Barbara Wilson, who is the Director of Collaboration and Community Partnerships for the Presbytery of Chicago, will be preaching. As we begin worship, remember that the peace and love of God is shown to us in the life of Jesus the Christ, surrounds us every minute of every day. This week, I encourage you to share that transforming peace with all you encounter, whether in person or on a screen. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. If you have a candle that you wish to use during our time of worship, you are invited to light it now. The Christ candle reminds us of Christ's presence in our lives, and it calls us to be that presence for all the world. Today we come to worship God, the living God, who calls prophets and teachers to bear witness to love. We have come to praise God, the Almighty God, who answers the forces of hatred and hurt with the power of grace. We have come to worship God, all gracious God, who chooses us to share love and grace with all people. Our opening prayer today is a prayer offered by the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Let us be in a time of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your church founded upon your word that challenges us to do more than sing and pray. But go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depends on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity.
Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together. Pray together. Sing together. And live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity in the reign of our Lord and of our God. We pray. Good morning. I have a couple questions for you to ponder for a minute. Can you think of someone who taught you something new or helped you think differently? Can you think of a time when you understood something that you didn't understand before? And how did that make you feel? And last, what would our world be like if everyone was willing to learn something new? even maybe every day. Well, this all has to do with our image for this week. And the image says, then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So we're gonna unpack that for a minute. Jesus opened there, and he's talking about the disciples' minds to understand the scriptures. And the scriptures are the Old Testament that talk about what God is commanding. See, right after Easter, remember how the, the tomb was open and the stone was rolled away? 
Well, Jesus appeared to his disciples on earth before he went to heaven after Easter. He appeared to his friends and he did some of the same things he had done before he had died. He talked with them. He ate with them. He walked with them on a journey. Most of all, he taught them because Jesus was a teacher and the name for teacher is rabbi. And he taught his students and the name for students is disciples or followers. And he taught them that they could better understand how God wanted them to love God and love one another. Jesus opened their minds so they could seek justice. Justice is a great idea where instead of some people having more than they need and other people having less than they need, it becomes more even. And everyone has what they need to live a good life. Justice is God's dream, and like Jesus' first disciples, if we listen to some of the things that God says and Jesus says, we can help make that dream come closer to being true. Let us pray. Dear God, open our minds to understand the scriptures. Open our hearts to love you and love each other. Open our imaginations to dream about how the world can be. And open our hands to help make that dream come true. Amen. Readings from the First Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 12 to 27. I am reading from The Voice. Just as the body is one whole made up of many different parts, and all the different parts comprise the one body, so it is with the Anointed One. We were all ceremoniously washed through baptism together into one body by one spirit. No matter our heritage, Jew or Greek, insider or outsider, no matter our status, oppressed or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Here's what I mean. The body is not made of one large part, but of many different parts. Would it seem right for the foot to cry, I'm not a hand, so I couldn't be part of this body? Even if it did, it wouldn't be any less joined to the body. And what about an ear? If an ear started to whine, I'm not an eye, I shouldn't be attached to this body. In all its pouting, it is still part of the body. Imagine the entire body as an eye. How would a giant eye be able to hear? And if the entire body were an ear, how would an ear be able to smell? This is where God comes in. God has miraculously put this body together. God placed each part of the exact place to perform an exact function. If all members were a single part, where would the body be? So now many members function within the one body. The eye cannot wail at the hand, I have no need for you. Nor could the head bellow at the feet, I won't go one more step with you. It's actually the opposite. The members who seem to have the weaker functions are necessary to keep the body moving. The body parts that seem less important we treat as some of our most valuable. And those unfit, untamed, unpresentable members we treat with an even greater modesty. That's something that the more presentable members don't need. But God designed the body in such a way that greater significance is given to the seemingly insignificant part. That way, there should be no division in the body. Instead, all the parts mutually depend on and care for one another. If one part is suffering, then all the members suffer alongside it. If one member is honored, then all the members are celebrated alongside it. You are the body of the anointed. Each and every one of you is a vital member. This is how the Book of Order talks about what it means to be church. And I quote, The church is to be a community of hope, rejoicing in the sure and certain knowledge that in Christ, God is making a new creation. This new creation is a new beginning for human life and for all things. The church lives in the present on the strength of that promised new creation. 
The church is to be a community of love where sin is forgiven, reconciliation is accomplished, and the dividing walls of hostility are torn down. The church is to be a community of witness, pointing beyond itself through word and work to the good news of God's transforming grace in Christ Jesus. The church is to be a community of faith, entrusting itself to God alone, even at the risk of losing its life. I've never started a sermon by quoting the Book of Order, but I was reminded of its description of the church when reflecting on Paul's eloquent words about the church and about our need for one another as parts of the church, the body of Christ. I respond so positively to the dynamic picture of the church that Paul paints for us. And it resonates with how our book of order talks about whom we are and what we are called to do. Now, usually when preaching from this text in Corinthians, I like to focus on how we each have a role to play as the body of Christ. And I emphasize the fact that everyone is needed. I assumed that that was what I would preach this time when doing my planning a few weeks ago. But as I approach the text, the fact that we have been physically absent from one another for over a year gave new meaning to Paul's words. I was struck by Paul's reminder that we are the body together. It is a very real reminder that being a church is not defined by having a building. The church is not a minister, Sunday school teachers, or the choir. It is not the little food pantry or senior high mission trips. No one person, no one group of people, no one activity, no building is the church. The church is the body of Christ. And that is all of us watching and worshiping today. Whether in Riverside, Illinois, or Berwyn, or Cicero, or Wisconsin, or Pennsylvania, or Oklahoma, or Arizona, Wherever you are, we are the church together. You might have seen or heard about the recent Gallup poll. I believe it was published last Monday. It reports that fewer than half of adults in the United States say they belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque. This is a dramatic trend away from religious affiliation in recent years among all age groups. That number is the lowest number reported since Gallup began asking the question more than 80 years ago. I think this number struck fear in some and affirmed what others have experienced over the last 25 years, including me. But I don't think Paul would be alarmed, afraid, or even surprised by these numbers. According to Paul, church is not something that we belong to. Let me say that again. Church is not something we belong to. Church is something that we are. Paul would be surprised and shocked about how we modern Christians talk about church membership. And he would most likely encourage us to rethink our very ideas of church membership. You know, sometimes people will talk about joining the church as if it were some club or a civic organization like the Lions or Rotary. With those kinds of groups, you sign up, pay dues, sometimes do service projects, attend meetings when you feel like it, and then when someone makes you mad, or you don't like the programs that are presented, or who the new president is, or where or when they decide to meet you, Turn in your membership card, and you go on your way. Or, more likely, you just stop showing up. But that is not what church is. 
The church is the body of Christ, and each of us together are part of that body and then part of each other. When someone gets mad, it affects the rest of us. When someone gossips about somebody else, it affects all of us. When someone just decides not to show up anymore, it affects all of us. When another is treated with injustice, we all experience that injustice. We are not Christians alone. We are not separate actors choosing our own views without reference to the faith. Always, we are together, part of the whole. I think over the past year, we have really begun to learn what it means to be a church and to be a part of the whole. As we have suspended in-person worship and meetings, as we have learned to prepare and take communion on our own, as we have made social distancing a way of life, I think Paul's description of the church takes on new meaning for us. As we have learned new ways to be together, to support one another, to do mission, we begin to understand how Paul and even our book of order describes church. Personally, the grace that I have received from you, the notes and emails of support, the absence of judgment as we navigate a different way to worship, has been a shining example of what it means to be church. And I pray that we take what we are learning with us into the future. As we continue to move forward, I ask that you continue to remember what we have learned about being church. The movie Shall We Dance tells the story of a bored, overworked estate lawyer who, upon first sight of a beautiful dance instructor, signs up for ballroom dancing lessons. His wife is sure that he is having an affair. Susan Sarandon plays his wife. After she learns he's not having an affair, she describes to another person why people get married. We're going to watch that clip, and as you are watching it, I want you to imagine that instead of marriage, she is talking about our relationship with each other and the world as the church. All these promises that we make and we break, why is it, do you think, that people get married? Passion. No. It's interesting, because I would have taken you for a romantic. Why then? Because we need a witness to our lives. There's a billion people on the planet. I mean, what does any one life really mean? But in a marriage, you're promising to care about everything. The good things, the bad things, the terrible things, the mundane things. All of it, all the time, every day. You're saying your life will not go unnoticed because I will notice it. Your life will not go unwitnessed because I will be your witness. <laughs> you can quote me on that if you like. By caring for and supporting one another, we are recognizing the presence of Christ in each other. So here is what I think church membership means. It means that you promise that you will be a witness for each other. You promise to care about everything for each other. You say to one another, your life will not go unnoticed or unfulfilled. And as the church, we then look beyond ourselves to the world and we say the exact same things. I think that is what Jesus did over and over and over again for people. He bore witness of their lives. Not judgment, but witness. Not condemnation, but witness. In a broken and fearful and often desperate world, where conflict and contention and extremism and lack of civility seem to have become the 
rule instead of the exception, we need to remember the actions of Jesus. In a violent world where death and injustice surround us, we must remember that as the church, we are called to bear witness to the lives of those killed in the streets, those who face homelessness and hunger, those living under the oppression of racism, homophobia, genderphobia, and xenophobia. We are called to be witnesses for each other and for every living thing in this world. We are called to bear witness to the grace and presence of God in, in all people. That is what it means to be church. And I believe that if that is what churches did, instead of worrying about membership numbers and attendance numbers and, and money, well, we would in fact be church. We would be the body of Christ. We, just as Jesus did, would bear witness to the lives of all those around us. We have to give up worrying about whether somebody is a member and just start bearing witness to each other and everyone's lives. That's what it means to be church. Hallelujah. Amen.
as we take time for a prayer today, please join me in remembering the family of Adam Toledo, the 13-year-old boy who was killed in Chicago last month. The victims and their families involved in the most recent mass shooting in Indianapolis. Join me in praying for a society where violence is common and where we place individual rights above the well-being of all of God's children. Let us pray. When powers struggle for dominance and war, oppression, and abuse result, when groups of people oppose one another because of ideology, religion, or culture, we need a God who is bigger than ourselves and our personal interests. When people are disregarded and devalued because of poverty, geography, or disease, when compassion and justice is withheld to some because of sexuality, race, or gender, we need a Christ who is more compassionate than we are, who includes even those we would exclude. When resources are mismanaged and abused, and the world and its creatures are destroyed, when motivation is scarce and creativity is in short supply to address the challenges that we face, we need a spirit who is more powerful and more creative than we could ever be. Lord God, loving Christ, empowering spirit, we offer you these prayers because we need you so desperately because our world needs you so desperately. Captivate us, call us, and fill us that we might be carriers of your eternal love and abiding grace to this world that you love so dearly. And now hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people. so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. To bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. Amen.